because we are kings and our words matter. Please turn with me to Romans chapter 5 and let me read to you verse 17. Romans 5, 17. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. We've been considering this wonderful truth for the last several weeks, a series of teachings on who we are, what we possess, and what we can do. In this teaching, we've been covering basically all that has been given to us in the new covenant in and through Jesus Christ. The New Testament, the thing that we call New Testament, the portion of the Bible that we call New Testament, consists of these things, the things that God has given to us through redemption. The new covenant came into effect or it was inaugurated, you may say, with the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And since that time, it's been in effect. And therefore, the epistles particularly are expressly written to convey to us all that has been given to us. So if you think of the New Testament as a kind of a will, I think that's the best way to do it because God has given us so much. God has so much. He has given us so much. And the New Testament is a document that gives us what God has given to us by his grace. That's the way we must approach the New Testament, the epistles. So we began to look from the book of Romans and uh, looked at the first chapter. We found out that we were saints. 
then we came to the fifth chapter we talked about righteousness how that god has made us righteous and then we started looking at what we can do as a result of righteousness and that is we reign in this life that's why i read to you verse 17 it says that they who have received the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one jesus christ shall is used there to indicate the certainty of it they shall reign it's not that they shall in some future time it is a word of certainty they shall reign they shall reign now not in the future not in the thousand year reign not when we get to heaven reign now some translations have translated it like that they shall reign in this life it says still better one translation translates it like this they shall reign as kings in this life so we've been made as kings and priests the bible says and we are made to reign and rule we looked at all of that in the beginning god made man made him to reign the very first thing that god said to man as soon as he made him he said subdue everything and have dominion in other word reign in the book of revelation in the closing chapters chapter 22 if you see it says we will reign forever with jesus christ in the very first chapter it says subdue and have dominion reign in the last chapter it says reign forever in between something got messed up we who are born to reign and who are destined to reign forever have got messed up through sin we ceased reigning and we started being slaves to sin and death and all kinds of things and jesus came 2000 years ago to set us free from that and to help us start reigning now itself and that's the whole story of the bible in short how do we reign we reign with words if a king wants something done he doesn't go get things done he sends word he just tells someone bring it he tells someone go over there he say gives orders and it is done that's how the king conducts his business so words are very important we must rule and reign with words i've taught much about words and it is very important to remember that here even ruling and reigning is by words by words we reign you need to be a person of your word and you need to be a, and then you'll be a person of faith it's very important to understand these things now we're going to talk about how this ruling and reigning happens in a practical way please turn with me to matthew's gospel chapter 16 Matthew chapter 16 and let me read to you from verse 15 onwards you remember the incidents where Jesus asked the disciples saying who do men say that i am what does everybody think about me who do they say i am they said well some say you're elias some say you're jeremiah john the baptist or one of the prophets everybody was wrong no one was right so jesus said all right never mind none of them got it let's see if you got it he says to the disciples who do you say i am and uh, now we have the answer in verse 16 and simon peter answered and said thou art the christ the son of the living god as soon as he said that you see this is a very significant statement nobody understood nobody seems to have caught this point that he is the son of the living god christ the son of the living god that's a significant revelation and as soon as that was said it sparks some wonderful statements on the part of jesus he declares something now and jesus answered and said unto him blessed art thou simon bar jona for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee but my father which is in heaven now i guess like i said the other day adam was a representative man because he was the first man as such he was a representative man whatever was said to adam was said to the entire human race because he was the first one the words spoken to him were different in the sense that it was applicable to all human race it was words spoken about the human race in the same way the words spoken to peter is words spoken to all those who will confess jesus as christ the son of the living god and receive him as their savior and lord Here is the first one that got a revelation concerning that that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. Not only got a revelation, he speaks it out. So when Jesus now speaks some things to him, he speaks some very important things to him and this applies not only to Peter but to everyone. So when he said, "Blessed art thou, 
it means not just Simon is blessed, Peter is blessed, all of us are blessed. How many are blessed here? If you have got the revelation that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God, you're blessed. It applies to all of us. Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, son of Jonah, it means. For flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you. You could not have come to this conclusion just by your intellect. That's what it means. But my father which is in heaven, this has come to you by revelation. Something spiritual has happened. This has come to you by revelation. See, salvation happens like that. Paul was resisting Jesus and was hating Jesus, was going around killing people that preached Christ because he thought uh, that this is not the Christ. His whole business was to go catch people and kill. But then he met Jesus and it was revealed to him by the Father in heaven that this is the Christ. And then immediately he started preaching that Jesus is the Lord. The entire thing changed in one day, just like that. The man who hated Christians and Christ now is preaching that Jesus Christ is Lord. Something spiritual happens. This is something that a man receives by spiritual input, not just intellectual knowledge. All right? So Jesus says, you're blessed because the Father in heaven has revealed it to you. You got a revelation concerning this. And then he says, I also say unto thee, that thou art Peter. Now this also fits us. Thou art Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is very much uh, true about us. The keys of the kingdom of heaven is not just given to Peter because a lot of people think it's given to Peter. If it was given to Peter, then I'll tell you I'm finished. Maybe Peter doesn't like me very much. You know, he won't be given too much to me. He may say, I don't like Sam Chaladere. Tell him to forget it, you know. When Jesus said, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, it's not just to Peter. It is to every single person who has received this revelation that Jesus is the son of God and confessed Jesus as Lord and Savior in their lives. It is said to every single person, I'll give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you got the keys to the kingdom of heaven, you must be an important person. If every one of you have got the keys to the kingdom of heaven, that's very important, my friend. When we lock up this place and we go home today, the key is held by just one or two people here. We don't give a copy to everyone in town because there's some valuable stuff here. It's kept by one or two people here and we got a watchman 24 hours, one inside, one outside and all of that stuff. Because there's some important stuff here, nobody can just enter in and do whatever they want. The key, the person who has the key is like a ruler in this place. Without him, nothing can move. You can't take anything out. You can't bring anything in. You can't do anything in here without his permission because he's got the key. He's an official. He is a person with some authority. He rules and reigns in this place. He's an important person. Now, the kingdom of heaven is much more than this campus here. The kingdom of heaven is a whole lot more, my friend. All the blessings of God, all the rights and privileges, all the power and all the authority that belongs to this kingdom of heaven, God's domain, the territory over which God rules and reigns, and all that is there in it, every good thing that belongs to the kingdom is yours because the keys to that kingdom is given in your hands. You can access it. You can go to it. You can make use of it. That's what it means. I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. But the thing is, do you know how to use the keys? That's where a lot of people go wrong. Do you know how to even put it in and turn it in? Do you know how to operate it? Do you know how to open? Do you know how to shut it? Do you know how to lock? Do you know how to open it? He says, I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Then he talks about how this key works. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So with these keys to the kingdom, you can actually bind and loose. Binding and loosing. Now how do you bind and loose? You bind and loose in the kingdom of heaven. You bind and loose with words. You bind certain things. When you see something's happening and you don't like it, and you know that's not the will of God for your life, you begin to bind that thing. You begin to bind that devil, bind that situation, 
bind whatever is going on. You put a hold on that. You stop it. You say, get out in the name of Jesus. You say, stop it in the name of Jesus. Because you know that this is not from God. You can bind and you can loose. This is how the key works. Now, a lot of people have not really caught this truth. I think some of them are going to find out only when they get to heaven that there is anything like binding and loosing because they say most of the Christian people are like this. They're big on the sovereignty of God and I don't blame them for it. I believe in the sovereignty of God also. The sovereignty of God means that God is all-powerful. He has his own will and he knows how to execute his will and he's able and well able to execute his will. He'll do whatever he very well likes. Yeah, I believe it. But what they do is, they say, that means now, there's no use in us binding or losing. How can we bind anything or lose anything if God is all-powerful, God is sovereign, and he's got his own ideas and plans. He does whatever he wants. So we can't bind or lose whatever God wishes and wills for us. That's what happens to us. In Tamil, they call Thalayilati, no? They say, for everyone, God has written something on their head. It's amazing that Christian people also believe this kind of stuff. After having the Bible, this bigger Bible, they're only talking about what's written here. Nothing written here, my friend. Everything is written here and it must get here. And it must get here. Inside the heart, you see. So, a lot of people believe that whatever is going to happen is going to happen, brother. Now, Tuesday night, I was sharing with people there are two kinds of people in the world, you know. The ones who believe that every, everything happens as an accident. Anything is an accident. You got married, it's an accident. You got divorced, it's an accident. You got sick, it's an accident. You're well, you're an accident. You know, you got rich, it's an accident. You got poor, it's an accident. You lost everything, it's an accident. You gained much, it's an accident. Everything is an accident. It's called the theory of contingency. You see, they believe that. Everything is an accident. And there is the other half that believe that everything that will happen, it will happen. Whatever will be, will be. Right? So those who believe in the accident theory, they believe that what is the use of binding and losing? What, everything happens in an accident. Nothing is orderly. It's going to happen as an accident. You don't know what's going to happen. And those who believe that everything, whatever will be, will be, they also believe that whatever will be, will be. There's no use binding and losing and all that. Whatever will be, will be. Right? Both are worried. The guy that believes in the accident worries what accident may happen. And the guy that believes in whatever will be, will be, is also worried because what will be, he doesn't know. <laughs> and he can't do anything about it. He can't change it. Yeah? That's the way the world thinks. But let's think like the Bible thinks. The Bible doesn't say anything like that. The Bible teaches about God's power, his omnipotence and all that. And, and, and we are all for that. But the thing is, the Bible says that whatever you bind will be bound. Whatever you lose will be loosed. It tells me that your life is now in your hands. What you allow into your life, what you permit into your life depends upon you. Whatever you allow is going to be allowed. Whatever you bind is going to be bound in your life. You are in charge. You got the keys. God didn't say, I got the keys. Come to me whenever you want. No. He said, you, I give you the keys. God honors us by giving us the keys so that we can choose whatever we want. Bible says that, Bible teaches that God has given a man a free will. Free will means that man has a choice always. He can choose what he wants. That's how Adam was able to sin because he chose to sin. Sometimes man goes the wrong direction with it. But he must have the free will, otherwise he cannot be a human being in the image and likeness of God. You take away the human, uh, the free will, then he becomes like a machine. He becomes like a slave. You can't make him love God. You, can, you cannot compel him to live for God and all that. He must love God with his heart, desiring to love God. He must obey God willingly. See, that's what love is all about. That's what obedience is all about. You've decided to do that, even though you have an option not to obey. Right? There are a thousand women in the world, but you married one. You chose. Some people are saying, my God. <laughs> Some people are saying, well, my parents chose, brother. 
you are responsible you said yes you tied the thing you took her home you got the children no it's no sense talking about how my parents fixed it up you were right there you were the one that got married right so thousand are there but you picked one In the bible it talks about a man who had a thousand and could not find one right one you remember that man a solomon <laughs> he had a thousand he said but i have not found one <laughs> there are men like that today in the world but there are thousand but out of the thousand you didn't say i'll take five or i'll take 10 no he said i'll take one and you stick with that one forever right <laughs> your choice you made that choice nobody compelled you nobody forces you no you don't have to be compelled forced you you made the choice so man has a choice god gave adam and eve a choice they had the choice from the very beginning god could have tied his hands and legs and put him in a room and said don't sin don't don't talk to the devil i won't allow you to go anywhere because the devil may get you no he never did that god let him be free adam was free he was never bound he always had the option and the choice to go wherever he wants do whatever he wants eat all the fruit of every tree and everything only one tree out of which he could not eat and the devil comes in there and talks to him and now he's confronted with a choice should i do what the devil says or should i do what god says and adam went the wrong way what did god do people say well god why did he allow brother god says you allow whatever you want to allow you disallow whatever you want to disallow you prohibit and you allow whatever you bind will be bound whatever you loose will be loosed he has given you the authority he wants you to be a man stand up and be a man he says so man allowed when the devil came in he brought death he brought sin he brought all the evil and everything today people say why is all the evil there in the world why god who created the why can't he interfere do something why is all the evil god is only responsible for this no god says i'm not responsible for all the things that's going on god is not responsible because man is the one who through his sin through his unbelief through his lust and through his greed has brought upon him all the destruction not only adam even today when destruction comes to a person when failure comes to a person when a person fails miserably flat on his face when a person is in that state and condition often times he looks up to god and say why god why me <laughs> as if god has done this to him but god says why why did you do this to yourself any time we fail any time we lack and want any time we fail in what we do mainly because of our unbelief because of our sin because of our greed because of our lust because of all these sin based things that are acting up from within us right the other day i was look, listening to a television uh, discussion going on on the financial uh, turmoil that the world is experiencing today every country almost is in trouble right now all the rich countries are in trouble entire continents affected by this financial trouble everybody's worried and they're talking about it and this is not people that coming from the bible you know telling things they're just people in the world they're talking from their perspective they know business they know finance they're talking about it and you know what they're saying they said we are in this condition because of the greed that is in the market greed has driven us to this condition because of the greed what is greed see the world's economy is based on greed what is greed gather as much as you can don't have no mercy just pick here and there push and shove and kick and do whatever you can to get as much as you can don't have no mercy just pack up everything get all you can can all you get and sit on your can that's their philosophy no mercy philosophy just get as much profit as possible so they started loaning here and there they didn't care whether you can pay back or not you know you're able to pay back 10000 rupees or they're ready to loan you 20000 you know monthly payment how you'll pay god only knows 
they'll call you 10 times a day wanting to you to take a loan you say i don't want one guy told me take at least the minimum sir <laughs> so why should i take the minimum i don't need the minimum i don't need the maximum i don't need the minimum why do i want so just take something sir why should i take it because the interest is low sir yeah you'll take me low with it <laughs> <laughs> they all want to give you something. And I'll tell you when they start talking like that, I know there is no one good but God. Nobody's trying to help me in this world. Nobody's trying to give something to me for nothing. No, no, no. Don't believe that, my friend. Only there is only one person I know. That's my father, God. When he calls me and says, here, take it, I'm ready to take it. My policy is if God gives it, I'll take it. Low interest? No. No. that's too high for me hello <laughs> greed greed where does it come from it comes from a sinful heart selfishness that wants to just gather for oneself as much as possible that's where greed comes from Thank you. 